This is Steve Zeltzer, and I'm with Workweek. It's a radio station, KPOO in San Francisco, and also with Pacifica Capitalism, Race, and Democracy and KPFK's Working Voices. And I'm also a member of HEAT, the Higher Education Action Team. And the panel tonight that we're going to be having is looking at the ACCJC and the and FICMAT Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team. And first, we'll have uh, Rick Baum, who's a member of AFT 2121, talk about HEAT and what it is. Rick? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone who's here. Just real briefly, HEAT was formed in the fall of 2019 by part-time faculty who feel that we, we get a raw deal at City College. And then we quickly expanded to include community members or even full-time faculty, students, anybody who was interested. And we held a number of rallies and demonstrations. The first one was a funeral march to mourn the cuts of classes that were taking place. Later, we had another one called Putting Students First, since that was a slogan of the chancellor at the time. And we've held a number of other things afterwards. Probably best if people want to learn more about HEAT is to go to our website. Um, we've become a small group partly during COVID and Maybe we can soon become revitalized because there certainly is a need. Um, no one is at the college right now taking on the ACCJC, which is very disappointing. It's a different situation than we had the first time the ACCJC went after the college. Um, now you've got people who are embracing what the ACCJC is doing. But I don't want to talk too much more about it. That's maybe brief. Hey, maybe you can you. say what the ACCJC is. Actually, it's called the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges. And the Fiscal Crisis and Management Assistance Team uh, is funded by the state of California. It's a nonprofit uh, set up by the state to supervise and do oversight of not only the community colleges, but also K through 12. And they have a long history, which we're going to talk about tonight their role in uh, particularly attacking urban schools, black and brown schools, and, and forcing privatization. So I think this is a, a very important uh, discussion and debate, and there have been actions which we can talk about earlier. Uh, in fact, there was a demonstration against FICMAT a couple of years ago in Los Angeles, uh, particularly involving people from Compton Community College and the, and the schools which have been under attack. So thank you for joining us. And our first speaker tonight is Madeline Mueller, She's a longtime uh, music teacher, the head of the music department, and also uh, she's been an activist in fighting uh, at City College and the community to keep it a community college and to keep it a public institution. So, uh, and she's a member of HEAT. Welcome, Madeline. Hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, tonight I I had I have been working on a letter that I wanted to send out to college constituents, and it really fits this theme of tonight, uh, to take a real careful look at the current way that the ACCJC has been reconstituted and what are they up to. So I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read my letter and it will go out tonight. Uh, I've sent it to a few folks already, but any case, there's a bit of history because I save things and I have boxes of history and it's all documented and so forth, but I tried to keep it simple enough. Uh, <clears throat> so, seven years ago, seven years, geez, City College of San Francisco was promised that when it was next reviewed by a reconstituted accrediting commission for community and junior colleges, ACCJC, that CCSF would receive a fair evaluation. Is that currently happening or is history repeating itself? Up until the completely illegal accreditation mess beginning in 2012, which was proven illegal in two courts of law, CCSF was the only community college which had never received any of the sanction level options imposed by ACCJC. I was on visiting teams. I've been a part of ACCJC over the decades that I've been at the college. And every other school I've seen the data has had at some point in their careers and their histories uh, sanctions. City College never, never had a, any sanctions all those decades. So the options for sanctions in order of seriousness are first warning and then goes to probation and then theoretically goes to show cause. There are other possibilities short of sanctions. However, CCSF, like many other colleges, has had conversations about issues using informal procedures. 
The 2012 ACCJC visiting team had considered issuing a warning which would have been the first formal sanction issued against City College. And they were as shocked as the rest of California when Barbara Bino's ACCJC commissioners, she was the president, <clears throat> instead voted to skip over the procedural steps, warning probation show cause, <clears throat> and jump to show cause, meaning that the college would have to show cause for its existence. The commission used many lies and fake criteria, including the truly crazy criteria, in quotes, based on allegations neither proven nor disproven. <laughs> Later, the commission president admitted under oath that she, we have the transcripts, that she had made substantial changes to the visiting team's report. When they had found the college had met standards, she simply changed the verdicts to did not meet standards. And this is documented in the book Free City, pages 115 and 116. <clears throat> you know, an honest person, though, she didn't lie under oath. I don't know if people would take that route these days. I'm editorializing here. Anyway, <clears throat> then at that time, there were also two emails uncovered by Marty Hittleman, author of ACCJC Gone Wild, that were sent out on July 3rd in 2013. I have copies. Between uh, these three, um, the two emails were between the president of ACCJC, the state chancellor, and the head of Illumina organization in Washington, DC. The, the initials were ACE. Uh, they congratulated each other on getting the approval of the State Board of Governors that day. We'll live in infamy. Uh, to vote to shut down CCSF. <clears throat> During the several following years, they kept trying to destroy the college. They illegally removed the elected trustees and replaced them with a state appointed trustee who ran the school into as much financial ruin as he could while imposing a different chancellor of his choice almost every year. Uh, I was on a hiring committee once where pretend hiring committee where he told us interview anything that breathes send them all to me I'll pick who I choose if somebody is on that isn't on that list I'll pick that person anyway that's what he told the, the hiring committee also during those years the local major press blamed the faculty and the powerless expelled trustees for financial problems which did not exist at the time of the illegally applied show cause sanction in addition, the faculty were usually depicted as driving away administrators because they, the faculty, were, in quotes, unmanageable, which was not true. The churn was entirely orchestrated by those brought in by the state board and chancellor to ruin, um, to run, <laughs> Freudian slip, to run ruin um, City College. Why? That is a long story, which is very well described and documented in this book. Oh, I'll give it a commercial again. And it's subtitled Free City, uh, the fight for San Francisco's city colleges, or for San Francisco's city college and education for all. It's available through Amazon or from um, directly PM Press. Given the stress of recovering from those takeover years, they've been called, plus the pandemic, Certainly everyone has been under a great deal of pressure for a long time to save City College. Lately that has involved too many colleagues being angry with each other. Let's not forget uh, the lessons learned together during the last dozen years. Let's study the various union contracts signed recently. Maybe resolution of some of the current ACCJC fiscal demands are workable within those contracts. However, the commission must show some flexibility concerning two main fiscal issues, the so-called OPEB, other post-employment benefits, prepayment issue, has to be investigated much more thoroughly. And the state chancellor's recommendation up to this point via the ACCJC to have enough funds put aside in City College's cash reserves, cash reserves, to pay for two months of any state delay 
in returning San Francisco property tax money back to the district on time to meet necessary college bills. This is sometimes called the deficit factor, or there's another term. Uh, drives us all crazy. But I'm saying if the state chancellor is so concerned that the state, the state chancellor, can't meet its obligation to return funds on time, then I think either hire the staff to do the job or keep a rainy day fund within the state chancellor's budget to cover such mismanagement at the state level. And there's a lot of that, but the colleges get the blame. Any rate, meanwhile, I'm heading off. City College will soon have a different administrative fiscal team. The current vice chancellor of finance is leaving in June and should be better positioned to present budget numbers in more consistent forms for college and community groups to understand and work with more effectively. And finally, the current new reformed ACCJC should acknowledge the great damage its previous commission, uh, its previous rogue commission, did to CCSF students and all employees at the college, as well as the people of San Francisco. The current commission needs to show that it is truly different than its rogue predecessor. It should be noted that in administrative stability factor is very important right now at City College. Two of the four vice chancellors will be leaving soon and another is not firmly in place yet. A decision to extend the chancellor's contract would be a step towards maintaining stability given these changes. Plus, can the three issues for sanctions involving the chancellor and this board actually be addressed and resolved appropriately within the fairly tight time frame given, given if the board doesn't offer a renewal contract to the chancellor or on the other side of the equation if the current board is put on risk for dismissal? Can. As with anything involving humans, many people have been part of good and bad decisions lately at City College. Let's all take some deep breaths and listen to some calming music. I'm for that. A nice drink of choice won't hurt either. Let's come back together as colleagues. We need everybody on board, pun intended. There are some real enemies and dangers out there. Let's focus on fighting, blaming, criticizing them and not each other. As Benjamin, Brand <laughs> Benjamin Franklin is reported to have said, we must all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. Okay, thank you, Madeline. So our next speaker is George Wright. He was uh, a retired professor at AFT Local 1493 in Skyline College. Uh, previously, he was a professor at Chico State, where he now resides. And he has uh, been engaged in a long time struggle against corporatization and privatization of community colleges and the public education system. Welcome, George. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, more or less give a general overview of uh, how I've observed uh, public education over the last 60 years or so. And uh, that history entails literally going to a public high school in Los Angeles in the early 60s and then uh, going to uh, community college or actually it was called junior college <laughs> in, in the early 60s, uh, uh, Los Angeles Harbor College in Wilmington, and then uh, going to state college uh, where I earned a BA and an MA. And once I finished there, uh, I actually taught high school for a couple of years and then taught at Cal State University Chico for 36 years and then retired and ended up teaching at Skyline Community College in uh, uh, San Bruno for eight years teaching history. So I have a, a long history with public education uh, in California and have some strong uh, feelings and attitudes about that experience. I guess the first point I want to make is I kind of believe I'm a child of the California Master Plan for Higher Education, which was put into place by the first governor, uh, Pat Brown, 
in the around 1960, which created a, a three-tier educational system, including the community colleges, the state colleges, as which later became state universities, as well as the university system. Uh, the philosophy behind uh, the California Master Plan for Higher Education was that it was going to be free for students and it was going to be accessible for everyone with either a high school degree or a GDE or, or, or equivalent uh, diploma. So it was possible to actually get a free education all the way through graduate uh, school, i.e. getting a PhD. Um, I retired in 2013, and to be very candid, I have not been active in uh, education, public education uh, during that time, but I have observed it from afar. And um, obviously some of my observations I think are still very, very cogent about the current situation. So what I'd like to do is uh, to comment on my views about public education and give some general analysis as to why uh, public education in California and for that matter around the country is in the plight or the condition that it is currently. Uh, the premise of my argument and certainly the topic of this panel has to do with the, the assault on public education. Uh, my argument is that if the 1960s, late 50s, into the very early 1970s was the high point of public education in California, since the mid to late 1970s, uh, public education has been under assault by separate but interrelated uh, political and economic forces which include uh, corporations, banks, and government, as well as the right wing. But including, though, though we can't exclude the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in that, in that project. Uh, for example, the role that the uh, political system has played has to do with uh, budgets for higher education and for uh, public education as well as a range of, of different uh, national projects that have been promoted by uh, different administrations, including Reagan's A Nation at Risk, uh, the first Bush's administration's America 2000, Bill Clinton's Goals 2000, the Education America Act, uh, George Bush's uh, No Child Left Behind, and Barama, uh, Barack Obama's Race to the Top and perhaps more specifically related to community colleges, his collegiate race to the top for college affordability and completion. From my vantage point, all of these are part of the assault on, on higher education. But what has been the objective of this assault? I think there are in general four objectives. One is to corporatize uh, higher education and to privatize uh, public education. Related to privatizing public e education, the objective is to capture the, the over $870 billion that is spent on public education annually by the private sector for its own uh, capital accumulation. As to the corporatization of public education, the objective is to run education like a business. More on that in a moment. From my perspective as a teacher, uh, how I see running education like a business, teaching, I believe, is an art form, uh, but the objective is to make teaching like working on an assembly line. And if it is in the interests of the managers at B, that it's a non-union assembly line. The second objective that plugs into the first objective is to restructure the curriculum to meet the profit needs of the private sector. There are many examples of that, but I think the most obvious example is the educational testing industry 
that has emerged over the last 30 years or so, which include the so-called big four, which is hardcore educational measurement, CTB McGraw-Hill, Riverside Publishing, which is a subsidiary of Houghton Mifflin, and the uh, maybe the most sinister of all, NCS Pearson. The third objective of uh, this project of privatization and corporatization is to water down, marginalize, or possibly eliminate the, the, the humanities, social sciences, revisionist history, ethnic studies, women's studies, and whatever curriculum that's involved with critical thinking. Uh, interestingly, just in the last month or so, uh, the 17 member Florida State University Board of Governors under the uh, authority of uh, Governor Ron DeSantis uh, eliminated sociology as a required uh, curriculum as part of their core course at Florida State University system. Uh, this is being replaced by what is called a, quote, factual history course, uh, which is aimed, obviously, to challenge the so-called liberal orthodoxy, et cetera. The fourth objective of um, this project is to defang, weaken, and or possibly break teacher unit unions. Uh, just in the last few months, uh, the California Federation of, uh, of California Faculty Association, its bureaucrats have worked hand in hand with the regents of the state colleges to uh, weaken the position of uh, faculty within that system. So those are, I think, the four major objectives of this project. Very quickly, what are some of the personal observations I've seen over the years? There are two general categories, and that has to do with the cost for teachers, I mean, for students, and secondly, the condition for teachers themselves. Uh, to give you a comparison, when I went to community college in 1962, uh, the cost of a semester was $7.50. In current dollars, that would be approximately $78. The state college cost in 1964 was $47.50, which would be about $467 a semester or about $934 for the entire year. Uh, for community colleges today, uh, the, the average unit is about $46 per unit, which means 15 units would cost per semester $690, or for the entire year, $1,380. As for the state colleges, uh, rather than a cost of nine hundred and thirty-four dollars in 1964 dollars, the amount costs some six hundred six thousand eight hundred and fourteen dollars, and if you add housing and food, we're talking about at least another fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year. So education has moved from being accessible, free, and a right to very expensive uh, as well as privilege. If you can afford it, or if you're willing to get into debt, you can get educated uh, in the California state public system. Uh, for example, related to debt, the average uh, uh, student with a four-year four degree uh, in California has accrued, acquired approximately $37,000 in debt. When I graduated with a master's degree many, many years ago, I had a debt of, I think, about $2,000, which was a uh, state guaranteed loan. I think the interest was like one or 2%. As for teaching, there's a lot that can be said, but basically um, education um, has, uh, you know, on, on this, has, has, 
it involved again working on a, an assembly line. Uh, actually, I'm not going to go into de any details there. I think everyone at, at, at hand understands some of the points I want to make. Let me wrap up and say why is this happened? Well, I think the 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 reason it, it's happened is going all the way back to the 1960s and early 1970s when America, U.S. capitalism began to face a massive crisis, a uh, structural crisis uh, that started with a falling rate of profit, stagflation, and a number of other factors. And what we see in the early 1970s is a deindustrialization of the American economy and shifting to outsourcing of manufacturing as well as a shift to um, a service-based economy based on supply side economics rather than Keynesian economics, as well as uh, more what is called monopoly financialization. What this shift economically structurally meant is a political agenda was changed to a corporate, a neoliberal agenda, which was involved in cutting taxes, deregulation, and privatizing the public sector, as well as weakening the unit unions. So this project of privatization and corporatization of public education that started in the 1970s is integral to the uh, neoliberal restructuring of the American political economy. Uh, I'm going to wrap up and just make a couple of comments as to what I think are solutions to all of this uh, or how we should view this project. First of all, we should recognize that the assault on public education specifically and the public sector in general is not simply a bipartisan political project carried out by Republicans and Democrats, but is dictated by the imperative of capital to maximize, maximize profit. Moreover, the assault on, public, on the public sector is not simply a national project, but is occurring throughout the interstate rural capitalist system. The second point I think is important is one must recognize that the Democratic Party and the trade union bureaucracy are agents of this neoliberal capitalist accumulation model. And they are not the solution to the problem, but they are in fact the, one of the key problems. And I think the final point I wanna make is that public education uh, must not be just simply refunded, but public education must be redefined to serve society within the com context of a complex transformation of society and its political economy. That requires a redefinition that should include critical thinking, historical perspective, the aesthetics, social tolerance, egalitarian and democratic principles, democratic with a small d, cooperative arrangements and projects, international cooperation and tolerance, anti-militarism anti -milita and training and research for an alternative sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you, George. So our next speaker is uh, Kathleen Carroll. And actually, I met Kathleen in a struggle to defend public education. <laughs> and she came to a meeting in San Francisco to talk about her struggle with the uh, California Commission on Teacher Credentials and what was going on there. But she is a longtime activist and also uh, w worked as an attorney uh, at the uh, agency. And she also took up a struggle as a whistleblower to expose a backlog of credentials. And she is quite knowledgeable about the educational system and, and uh, the structure of the educational system. So welcome, Kathleen. Thank you for having me, Steve. Yes, that was many years ago. <laughs> I think I was initially at a rally involving all the things happening in Egypt, and I saw the sign for your meeting, and I said, that sounds interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to be talking specifically about the Higher Education Act which sets forth the scheme of accreditation. So um, what hasn't been mentioned yet is accrediting, accreditation was used prior to the uh, formalization 
of the Higher Education Act of 1965. So essentially, if you go back to the GI Bill, um, which uh, funded schools for uh, various veterans, they wanted to ensure the money flowed to quality institutions, you know, not a fly by night school just out to make money, commit fraud, um, et cetera. But then as time went on, um, the accessibility and the expansions of schools, uh, colleges, and universities across the country um, was basically uh, they needed to rely on this quality assurance. And so they relied on these accrediting. Uh, entities, if you will. So I want to, you know, kind of go back. So there was a lot of discussion about City College and ACCJC, but ACCJC is just um, part of a wider network of a federal plan. And it, every single one of them are tied to student aid money, you know, in the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars. And um, so, I mean, obviously today with the costs that, you know, George just pointed out, a lot of students need to have help with uh, affording their tuition, their books, their costs, uh, whether it be transportation, housing, et cetera. So without student aid funding coming in, a lot of these schools and colleges would end up going bankrupt. Uh, the state is not enough. So, um, I want to you know just keep that in mind because this is a federal program, the Higher Edu Education Act, which I can tell you where the law is, Tw Title Twenty, which is all of education of the U.S. Code, Section Ten Ninety Nine at Sec. It just means start at that code, go to the end, and that's all about accreditation. Um, so essentially, when I first talked about accreditation. I was looking at what are these entities, these uh, ACCJCs, the Southern Accrediting Association, the New England Higher Education Commission, what are they? You know, and case law has shown that they're not government actors and yet they're not government agencies. So what are they? And to give you a little update um, and hopefully you, Got an, all the panelists got an email link to this case. And um, if you don't have, if you're not on the panelists, uh, then there is a link in the chat about the complaint. It might be the first link that's in the chat. So if you want to read about this case. Um, at the time I was speaking about it, I, I questioned the constitutionality as I was talking to Marilyn or George or Rick it didn't make sense to me that this can just set their own standards, change them whenever they want. No one's reviewing the standards. In fact, the Higher Education Act specifically says that the Department of Education is forbidden to review, modify, reject, or do anything in regards to these accrediting entities standards. They are to set forth the standards. They are the ones to modify them. And they can even add to them. And what's happening even worse is that they're doing it without much notice to the institution, not much ability for public comment. And um, there's a real abuse happening. Um, now, if you look at the federal government, the federal government is in a sticky position because the federal government is not allowed to control government of a state owned institution, whether it be City College of San Francisco, Florida State, or University of Oregon, they're not allowed to tell state regulators how to govern. And yet there's numerous examples from this lawsuit. So a lawsuit was filed in the state of Florida and the US District Court in St. Fort Lauderdale. And it's challenging the constitutionality of the whole accrediting system, which is good. It's not good that you know, it happens to be pushed by Ron DeSantis, who, as we know, likes to burn books and other things that 
I guess a number of us sitting here today find shocking, but um, the states do have a, a, a sovereign right to basically, you know, those things have been challenged. In fact, recently, I think I read a little bit about the don't say gay, which was not only propagated in Florida, but a number of Southern states that that recently legal challenge was settled. I don't want to know what the results are, but I'm sure if you Google it, you can find. Um, but the state of Florida last year on June 21st, 2023, filed this constitutional challenge. And of course the Biden administration immediately tried to toss out the case. Um, I don't have access now that I'm not in a government position to, uh, I have to go to a law library basically because I don't have access to LexisNexis or any federal court filings, but there was a document filed in November and that could be the attempt by the Biden administration to toss this case because it really was a nightmare. When it was um, put forth, the Higher Education Act, it was just this kind of patchwork. It got amended throughout the years, adding different, so there was a huge amendment in 1992, which actually gave more structure to what the accreditors are supposed to uh, use, or even their body. Um, they're supposed to include public membership, but if you look at a lot of the commission's members or even evaluation teams, you'll see them stockpiled with business types or business entities rather than true public members of the community, they're supposed to have um, academic members. And again, if you look at the members, whether it be an evaluation team or the commission, you'll see a lot of you know, business types, which kind of ties in possibly to this privatization agenda uh, with the White House, the current, right, uh, current administration. But this case, you know, is naming uh, people within the Department of Education. So Miguel uh, Cardona, who's the Education Secretary, Assistant Secretaries and Undersecretaries. And um, basically they're challenging the, the constitutionality uh, based on Article One of the Constitution, which basically states that a private entity such as the accrediting entities, I'm not gonna call them agencies because they're not considered agencies. Because if there were agencies, they would fall under the APA and someone would have challenged them years ago. There have to be parameters setting forth what they can and more importantly, what they can't do. Like maybe interfering with who's the college president or who's the chancellor and what the board can do and what the chancellor can do. Because that seriously, in my mind, has nothing to do with education quality. And that's what they're supposed to be focused on. Um, but yes, private non-delegation doctrine is prohibited under Article I. And the argument is, is that Congress, when they put forth this Higher Education Act, has ceded their unchecked power to private accrediting and agencies, um, uh, they're calling them agencies, but entities, to dictate education standards to college and universities. Col Congress has forbidden the U.S. Department of Ed from meaningful reviewing these standards that are written by the accrediting entities from approving them or rejecting them. Um, those standards are completely written by the likes of ACCJC. There's things added on without notice. I think there's a recent challenge um, with the board, uh, I guess, asking the, well, something about the removal of the chancellor, I'm not, maybe Madeline can answer that, but um, it's basically governance as opposed to quality. Um, and this is happening throughout the country. It's not just happening in San Francisco. It's not just happening in Florida. Um, examples uh, given in this particular case goes back to 2012 in University of Virginia the board, uh, the governing board was asking the president to resign. And for some reason, maybe privatization, maybe the president is on the privatization agenda, who knows? That's just speculation, my point. Um, they didn't like the uh, president to be asked to resign and they threatened accreditation status of University of Virginia. 
2021, University of Florida was threatened with accreditation status um, because the Florida State University uh, was considering the commission, the commissioner, the Florida Commissioner of Education for the Florida State University president. I know that's a lot <laughs> untangled there, a lot of Florida. But um, the reason given by their ACCJC, which the acronym is SACS, S-A-C-S, which governs the Southern uh, accrediting region, is that the person lacked experience and qualification. And yet the commissioner ed for years have been overseeing colleges and universities in the entire state. So it's that kind of thing that's just, and then there was another one that was more recent and it was the University of North Carolina it was actually putting forth a program where they would hire um, diverse uh, perspectives. And so they would kind of unlink any political constraints on what they could teach and who was involved uh, in the curriculum. So it, it is more diverse. And yet the stacks, their ACCJC, if that makes sense, <laughs> um, uh, didn't like it. And they publicly didn't like it by saying they were gonna get them to change it or they would threat them, threaten them with warning. So this has been going on for a long time. And uh, according to this complaint, um, the ACCJCs of the world uh, or the accrediting entities of the country and beyond are the gatekeepers of 112 billion, that's billion with a B, dollars of student aid funding, grants, federal loans, whatever, you know, across the country, they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones who write their own standards, review their own standards. If you appeal, guess you have to appeal to the Department of Ed? No, because they're prohibited from reviewing, rejecting, or modifying. You have to appeal to the ACC, JCs of the World's Commission. That's who you appeal to. Um, so, and they can't choose their masters. So they can't change their accreditor. One of the reasons is because they be, they're essentially monopolies. So, you know, for City College of San Francisco, if they wanted to change because they're disagreeing or they feel this group is misrepresenting facts or they're acting fraudulently or they're abusing power and they can't get along with them, the US Department of Education actually requires before you even begin the process of changing to show reasonable cause. And that's also being deb debated as to what is reasonable cause. I mean, practically, there's very difficult to change an accreditor when they're essentially monopolies um, over the region that a school or a college happens to be in. So that's not a way of mitigating the harm and Congress has given a broad power to apply their own standards, meaning, you know, like City College of San Francisco, they just, uh, you know, uh, kind of won a lawsuit. I, it, it was an odd lawsuit to me because they were using a business law, um, but the, what, regardless, the um, CCSF got a seven year extension of their accreditation status seven years is coming to a near where they're gonna have a new report due, but there's a new sanction that has come up before the, um, you know, the report is due. One thing um, that, you know, is good about this particular case is that it mentions other violations of the constitution, which is the appointment clause, because no head of an accrediting body has ever been appointed by a president and confirmed by the Senate. That's throughout the country. It's not just CCSF. And that violates the appointments clause. Also with the spending clause, the violations come down to the proper notice and comment that's required. So an educational institution will know, properly know, and meanly be able to understand what conditions apply to the receipt of money. And if they don't know, <laughs> they just kind of are able to add willy nilly these new conditions that keep piling on almost like gaslighting. 
um, an institution, then you know it, it becomes a constitutional issue. It, it's not fair and it's illegal. It's unconstitutional. Um, and these accreditation, um, you know, evaluations, they're not advisory and they're not optional. All colleges and universities must be accredited to participate in federal funding programs for any higher education institution. Um, I know Rick and I were talking before, and it was about online. So online uh, is a special entity. I'd have to look up the particular um, online school that's considered a community college, but online vocational schools, um, they have different bodies besides WASC for the four-year and the higher degrees, and ACCJCs are junior colleges and um community colleges. And this case, I think, is really important for all of us to watch because, you know, um, there are ways I see, I mean, Florida said, well, you could just uncouple the funding to accreditation, but that kind of loses the point of even using accreditation in the first place, which is to ensure a quality education for students while not coming up against some scam artists. And we certainly have known many, many instances like the Corinthian colleges that were defrauding students, um, but continued to receive um, accreditation status. They were getting tons of federal funds and had numerous schools under their umbrella. So um, I think I'm just gonna cut short here. <laughs> so I think it's an important case to watch. I'm excited about it, even though it is, uh, you know, state of Florida, but, it just want, want you to get thinking about this is not a, a state matter. Yes, it's all states have education codes dealing with accreditation, but it's still a federal scheme. It involves the use of federal student aid money, which is hundreds of billions of dollars. It's supposed to ensure quality, but as we know, they're starting to dictate standards that really should not be their business, which is governance. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I think this report is news to a lot of people uh, about the federal uh, laws that govern uh, these credit accrediting agencies. So our next uh, speaker is Rick Baum. Rick Baum is a, a lecturer at San Francisco City College, a member of AFT 2121, and has been engaged in a long struggle in the union and in the labor movement to try to get uh, the unions to do serious education on these issues. And I want to add before he goes on that one of the reasons we're having this has been there's been a failure of the unions, CFT and the unions, to have educational presentations. In fact, I've gone to CFT conventions. There have been no, no presentations on this whole use of these accrediting agencies to attack public education, which has been going on. So I think that's one of the reasons we're having this panel here tonight and uh, there are going to be others. So welcome, Rick. Okay, thank you, Steve. And thank you everyone for being here. I, I wanna kind of dovetail starting with what George was talking about. We live in a capitalist society and capitalism affects our, all of our institutions and our educational system that are shaped by the needs of this system. Among the key purposes of education in a capitalist society is to develop an ex acceptance among the populace for the existing system to reinforce our class structure that does allow for upward and downward mobility, but for most people, they're gonna remain in the class that they were born into, and to provide training to create a passive workforce with skills needed by business. That, that is you know, utterly, for at least the working class colleges like a community college, the purpose of our educational system. And for school, schools like City College, um, that's being brought about by corporate-minded administrators, enforced by agencies like FICMAT and the ACCJC. The last thing that these agencies are showing that they want is a truly educated and critically thinking population. And at the same time, they're seeking to put more and more power in the hands of a chancellor, state officials, and to keep it out of the hands of a democratically elected board of trustees, faculty, and students. They want to run things from a top-down position with absolute power at the top. Now, I personally support the notion of accreditation. I think it's often useful for outside group to come in 
and examine what's going on at a college and make recommendations about how they can improve upon what they're doing. And when need be, to even threaten a college with closure if it's doing a terrible job and if it's ripping off students as these, a lot of these for-profit colleges do. However, I also oppose accreditors that abuse their power and act to promote the corporate goals in higher education, which I would say the ACCJC has been doing. Um, for those unfamiliar with the ACCJC and it's going after City College in 2012, I wanna say a few brief things. In 2012, it placed the college on its harshest sanction of show cause. And as Madeline, I think, said earlier, show cause is that the college had a year to prove why it should remain open. So it's very serious when it put, a when it put the college on show cause. Yet, in the report, the visiting team for the ACC's JC in 2012 had this to say about City College. It's in structural programs and credit and non-credit, I'm reading from their report, provide high quality instruction to meet the needs of the community. Underline the word high quality instruction. At that time, and I think this is still the case today, the US Department of Education's guidelines states that, and this is their words, the goal of accreditation is to ensure that the education provided meets acceptable levels of quality. So the goal of the Department of Education is acceptable levels of quality. City College, according to the visiting team of the ACCJC, was offering high quality instruction. In addition, the visiting team confirmed that City College provides, in their words, comprehensive and accessible student services to its students. So not only does it provide exceptional services, but it also provides high quality instruction. I mean, that I hope this strikes you as a description of a college that should be celebrated, not one threatened with closure, which is what the ACCJC did in 2013. You know, we if we had time, we'd be going into what was the forces behind this, but it just shows the absurdity of what was going on at that time. The consequences of this action by the ACCJC, which was found, as Madeline pointed out, to be acting illegally when it threatened to close the college down, has been to severely downsize City College of San Francisco. Um, it's resulted in the closure of satellite campuses. Programs have been gutted like the one for older adults. There's literally thousands of fewer classes are being scheduled. I don't, you know, the number is actually in the thousands of fewer classes being scheduled. There's far fewer students and people working at the college. This downsizing has continued up to the present. We've had a slew of chancellors and each and every one of them has been continuing this downsizing of City College, constantly saying, oh, there's fiscal crisis. We have to solve the fiscal crisis and they solve it, and then there's a new fiscal crisis. The current chancellor arrived in November 2021. Immediately, or almost immediately, he nullified a contract that had been reached with the staff, and then laid off about 60 staff members. Then shortly thereafter, he acted to lay off 50 tenured full-time faculty. I mean, this comes on top of some 300 part-time faculty already losing their jobs. It was reduced to 38 because I think there were more retirements than they expected and they weren't replacing the retired full-time faculty. And he also acted to reduce the classes scheduled by 10%. In the fall of 2022, for those not familiar with City College, three faculty union-backed candidates were elected to the seven-member board of trustees. And their job, you know, they basically replaced members who had essentially, as do many of the current members were rubber stamping the downsizing decisions of the administration. In other words, they never challenged what the administration was doing. They just said, okay, we vote for it. And you know, by doing that, they were acting to deprive City College's working class students of educational opportunities because there are fewer classes being offered. Now, I personally am not completely enamored with the new board members, but they have made attempts to bring significant changes to the college that benefit students. One such change was a resolution that they passed at a board meeting in May, and they think they redid it again in July, to rehire laid off full-time faculty, that the union put forth a alternative budget to show that none of this was necessary. And they were doing so because there were classes that were completely enrolled with wait lists that students needed to get into that these laid off faculty could be teaching. You know, one of the classes in particular is called English 1A, 
the ACCJC's team report speaks about English 1A as one of the ways that the college is serving students. And I don't have the numbers for the fall term, but this was what happened in the spring, this recent spring term. You know, weeks before the term began, all these classes were full, the English 1A classes. By the time the term started, practically every one of them had wait lists of 10 students. In fact, I added up that there were 280 students on the wait list. For, for this class, and many of them can't add their names because they're limited to 10, and many are not going to bother to add their names because they see what's the point. And what the board tried to do in for the fall term was to rehire some of these full-time teachers to teach these classes, and the, that was resisted by the chancellor. He never added more classes. We added very few additional classes. In January, the ACCJC once again sanctioned City College all three of their reasons for sanctioning the college had to do with the Board of Trustees. And from my reading of their report, the resolution to add more classes was a prominent reason, if not the biggest reason, for sanctioning City College. They saw that the board was overstepping its authority by telling the chancellor to add more classes and rehire these people. Um, they said that the basically, I'm sorry, I'm losing my thought for a minute. They basically said that the board was violating its own policies by intervening in this way, that it was they, it was invalid for them to be directing the chancellor to do these things, even though the visiting team asserted that the role of the board is that it has ultimate responsibility, this is their words, for educational quality. So the board is responsible for educational quality. They wanted to add classes and they get dissed for doing so. You know, if the board is responsible for educational quality and the chancellor is resisting efforts to provide it, what's the board supposed to do? Ignore the needs of students, which is essentially what the ACCJC's visiting team is saying in sanctioning the college this time around. They also had the nerve to write in the report that City College, quote, demonstrates its commitment to students, unquote, shown, quote, through its available educational opportunities based on identified student and community needs with a high level of integrity and transparency. In other words, what a lot of what they're doing was covering up for the policies of the chancellor and the things that he's been doing during this time. It's not unique to the current chancellor. This has been going on for since 2012 with the people at the college. Um, and, and so, you know, they're trying to add more classes and that's not good for the ACCJC. There are also numerous other problems with their report that might lead you to conclude that they are not a very credible source. For example, facilities. They wrote about the facilities at the college that, quote, physical resources, general observations. The college assures that it has safe and sufficient physical resources at all locations that provide a healthy learning and working environment. Well, we learned that many buildings, at least last year, I don't know if they corrected them this year, had room temperatures well below 60 degrees in which students were supposed to be getting educated. And yet they were unaware that that was a problem and said that they said the facilities are fine. It, it just comes across as either some kind of cover up or gross incompetence on their part not to know this. There were news reports about the, the facilities and the lack of heat in many of the buildings that students were, you know, you see pictures of students that's on the um, union's website where, you know, they're all bundled up and they're barely able to you know, concentrate in the class because it's so cold. Another ridiculous thing in their, in their report on staff, they said on page 33, if you wanna look at it specifically, it's in the report that I wrote, the staffing levels of the college are adequate, unquote. But then a few pages later, they say, based on employee comments and team observations, staffing level has not been sufficient. So on the one hand, they're adequate, but they also are not sufficient. And then they go on to say, well, the budget, they're going to hire additional staff. And so that's going to be taken care of. So again, either the staffing is either adequate or it's insufficient. It can't be both. I mean, how can this report be taken seriously that this team ha has put out? I, I can't take it seriously. I also suspect, you know, since I have a couple more minutes, I guess, I want to go into this, that there's an anti-union sentiment. I mean, the administration has been horrible towards the faculty union this last year and a half. Our contract expired in July of 2022, and they just barely got a settlement in last December, only because of intervention by the board. I mean, they were having all kinds of trouble just even scheduling negotiating sessions with the administration. The leader 
of the ACCJC visiting team was the head of Pasadena City College. Right before, before she left, she was subject to a vote of no confidence by the Academic Senate and by the full-time faculty. She then went in May to Santa Barbara City College. My attitude is that she does not want a board that's supported by the union that tells her how to do her job. So that is one reason why she's taken this position of going after the board, which is the only thing that they're going after in the report. Everything else at the school supposedly is hunky-dory. Another reason why I think they have this anti-union perspective is that uh, vice president of the ACCJC is a woman named Gohar, and I won't say her name right, I'm sorry, Mojian, who had been an associate vice chancellor at City College. In 2014, she testified under oath during the trials, the following, she's asked question. So the AFT, that's the teachers union, was a hindrance to City College coming into compliance with the accreditation standards, true? Um, there's an interjection, the person's objection leading, but then the witness goes on, in my opinion, yes. So she's saying that the union was a hindrance to the college coming into compliance with their accreditation standards. I almost immediately after reading it, sent her an email asking for an explanation of how AFT was a hindrance because I wanted to know my own union, if they're a hindrance, I wanna know about it. But as has typically happened, she never replied. So that's a person who got hired to be a vice president at the ACCJC. Um, my conclusion is that in essence, once again, the ACCJC is abusing its power and deserves to be viewed with disrespect and contempt and resisted. There hasn't been any resistance at City College. In fact, what we have instead is people embracing what they're doing. Um, people saying, you know, the Academic Senate president has a resolution that wants to censor the Board of Trustees for getting the college into trouble with the ACCJC. Um, you know, they should be resisted as, it, as, you know, what the ACCJC is doing is acting to champion austerity policies and anti-union policies and, you know, which are, have been carried out by the administration that we can get into and discuss. And just, I just recently read an article in The Nation by Jonathan Kozel, and he says that once austerity is starting to be introduced at a school, it never ends. And that's what's been happening at City College. It's one austerity goal after another. I know that's happening in the Olden schools, that's happening in Peralta, and a lot of it is in these urban schools where the student population is predominantly working class, and they're also people of color. And they're just screwing over these people and depriving them of the educational opportunities they deserve. Probably part of the reason why they're doing this is because if you read the Department of Labor future job projections, they don't see that you need a well-educated population for a lot of jobs. They're going to be service jobs. They're going to be healthcare and things like that. So the attitude is probably why spend money on educating working class people when there aren't going to be jobs for them that meet their education level when all they need is their high school degree and they can go, you know, empty, you know, pans of older people in a rest home or something like that. So not a happy note to end on, but I think it, it's really what's going on is a political struggle. The ACCJC is on one side, they, they are on the side of the administration, they're on the side of the state chancellor, and the other side is the faculty and those who, who want a Democrat board that has say over the policies of how the college should be run. And that, that's what we're up against. So it's, not, it's, it's, it's a conflict and there's no getting around it as far as I'm concerned. But you know, let's have discussions and people have comments and we can be responding to them. So thank you. John, you're the first person on. Welcome, John. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Hi, uh, John Holmes. I spent four years uh, uh, teaching history at Peralta, and uh, I was on a rep. I was uh, representing the part timers on our union executive board, which I no longer am doing uh, because for the last few years, because of all the cutbacks at Peralta, I haven't had a class to teach. Uh, instead, I've gotten involved in a new coalition called the uh, uh, Higher Education La Labor United. Uh, which is having some two events, uh, one tomorrow night and one on the 23rd, but this is not the moment for announcements, so I'll talk about them uh, later towards the end of the meeting. The, the main comment I wanted to make is I, I really appreciate the presentations, uh, and in particular the overall background behind all this, which George Wright did very well, and some of the particulars of which uh, Rick Baum. I want to bring this to the state level. There is a master plan for the downsizing of community colleges, and it has an author. 
uh, Jerry Brown, uh, whose work has been continued by Gavin Newsom, the current governor of California. And the reasons for it have been all well laid out. Uh, I'll just say what it is. Namely, they want to take the community colleges and turn them away from their old uh, objectives and make them into number one, uh, voca strictly vocational colleges, but they're even less interested in that lately for the reason that Rick just alive. And two, the main thing they want to uh, have the community colleges be is to be feeder schools to the four-year schools for middle-class, mostly white uh, students whose grades were not good enough to get into the four-year colleges so they can uh, uh, so they can get prepped at the two-year colleges so they can, can be fed in. And there's mechanisms for that, which those of you who have worked at community colleges are all familiar with. And I'll just say this, if you want to have proof of this, uh, you can see the, the changing of the mission statement of the community colleges a couple of years ago. Remedial education is no longer a mission of the community colleges in the state of California, and, and uh, remedial classes are being abolished statewide, something which has uh, got much less protest. Now, uh, the ACCJC, the thing about the ACCJC, when reading all those things, the old rule is you always have to read between the lines. Uh, and once you've learned how to read, read the lines, as the famous revolutionary once said, you never want to read any other way, you know. And basically, uh, what's really revealing when they went out of SFCCC was the major reason they gave for going after uh, uh, CCSF. And the real reason was it was so much bigger than all the other community colleges. So they wanted to cut it down, vastly larger than the other community colleges. You know, they, and plus it had better union contracts and, and it had all the things they don't like. But, the real, uh, but as they actually stated on several occasions, the real reason for accreditation is they're spending too much money on, uh, on uh, faculty and students and not enough money on administration. That was right in the reports. And something else I'll mention, which uh, as a part-time representative, I particularly burned me. They said that one of the horrible things that uh, SFCC was doing was allowing uh, part-timers to have some health coverage, which as far as they've concerned was utterly something deserving of the accreditation right then and there so that pretty much tells you what it was all about uh i think uh i should stop right here and later i want to uh, talk about uh helu which is a very valuable new organization and the uh, two events they're having one tomorrow night and one in about a week in which uh carol lang who i think some of you are very familiar with is going to be one of the panelists thank you person is ellen my name is ellen yoshitsugu i am a student at um City College in the journalism department, and I've been assigned to write a story about this panel. I'm also a retired teacher and um, longtime member of UESF, which is the teachers union here in San Francisco. Uh, I have some specific questions. Um, in in uh, so Madeline said that I believe you said that the board. Am I understanding you right that the board refused to extend the contract of the chancellor? That's one question. Hold on. They're short. They're 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 to the point. Um, you suggested that by studying the existing union contracts, we could find ways to be um, work within work with the ACGC's requirements. That's my second question. I'd like to know more about that. Um, and I I listened to the January board of trustees meeting, and I was struck by something that two things. Two things that were said in that meeting. One was by Trustee Chisty. She said, I wonder what the board does when they, in other cases where they disagree with a policy that a college, that a board of trustees passes. So I wonder if this, if other people know of examples to answer Chisty's question. And the third thing, the fourth thing is Mary, Mary Grace Esteban, who is the Chancellor Martin's assistant, uh, spoke and she said well he's just the you know basically i'm paraphrasing she said basically he's the first chancellor that we've had in a while i had the balls to carry out a list that he did not create that was her quote and she said she's his assistant she's does a whole lot of things for him and with him what is that list what is she talking about so those are four questions i know that's a lot but they're specific thank you okay uh madeline you want to <clears throat> some of <clears throat> I wasn't making notes, so you'll have to remind me, but there is a meeting that's just been called for tomorrow. You know, there are board committee meetings, but there's a special meeting just uh, went out for at 3.30 that discusses, I guess, where they're at with the chancellor's contract. 
and I believe there have been meetings, it would have to be on various agendas of not renewing it, but I think the answer will be in part at tomorrow's meeting at 3.30, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then and then the second was, what? <laughs> Ellen, you have it on the list, your second. I think it's when the board disagrees yes. with the chancellor. Yeah, like mm -hmm. you said that with the work within the existing with labor the contracts. contracts. Well, right. I don't know. But <clears throat> the contract, I'm, I'm just saying, I've yet to really sense that we've had time. <clears throat> contracts were signed, the major one with this, the, the uh, AFT was signed right before winter break. Winter break is a time where you don't get much information. And then in January, we were just back and there's the ACCJC stuff. So I think that, I think we just haven't had a chance, I don't know the answer, to look at what the contracts did establish and get that dialogue going. Um, there, there may or may not be marvelous information in there, but just for me being around, because I don't go away during breaks, there hasn't been a way or that I know of that that discussion has been going on. And I think it should. If you've been, if you signed off contracts, we should know in context of the template given from ACCJC. And again, <clears throat> getting the details there, this has been all fairly recent and boards that meet once a month. And I know <clears throat> as amended reports, Anita Martinez had sent out I think it was now about three pages each time on the February agenda and the board agenda, or on the Jan January agenda and the February agenda, a lot of detailed questions that had to be done as a report because logistically there just wasn't the way that boards have to function as you know all of them at once. Lots of information in there. I've talked to the Senate and said, here's your homework. Get those, they're there, they're public. They had their, they came, she she said, I want these into the record. They're now in the record. We need time to look at the details that she put out, especially in conjunction with the, with the um, contracts and, and just get the facts, ma'am. Yeah, I, I think one of the questions that, that hasn't been addressed uh, is, is the politics of it. Right. Because, because basically there's been a hit attack on City College with the San Francisco Chronicle, with Mandelman, and, and board members who want to continue the wrecking operation of City College, collaborating with probably this agency. Because his newspaper articles were aimed at attacking the board that opposed the layoffs. That was what was what's going on. And that that, I mean, that political maneuver of the capitalists in San Francisco to attack this uh this board, the board majority is coordinated with uh, AC, ACCJC, in my view. Um, we don't have uh, the documents, the, the, uh, you know, the emails, but I'm sure they had correspondence with people at uh, City College who want to continue the record of closing classes, closing campuses, and attacking the school. I mean, the, the privatization agenda, you've got people like the head, the president of the Academic Senate attacking the, the board, uh, be, be uh, saying that they're violating the rules. This is the head of the academic senate, and one of the reasons I would add is there's been no ongoing education about the ACCJC and the record of of these agencies to educate people. Most people are unaware of it of, of their record of wrecking and destroying public education. That is a political problem. That's a political weakness. And the union has really not addressed that in any serious organized way to educate people about what we're facing. Well, yes. well the, bigger, the bigger picture, you have to understand that public education is grossly underfunded in California. That adds to the problems that we face. And then the administration squanders a lot of money on consultants. And if the union could speak about it, but they aren't here, how they manipulate, they prepay expenses that they don't need to. They want to put more money into reserves. When you do that, there's less money available for classes and for educating people. And that's, you know, that's coming down from the state chancellor. And that's a problem. Um, Martin sent out a letter, I think it was in late September, right before the ACCJC visiting team came, saying he would not seek renewal. He's the chancellor. 
he would not seek renewal of his contract in July. That to me was saying, I don't want to be here anymore. Why did he do that? We don't know the official, there's no official reason, the speculation, that's all that we can do. But there are, there is a movement to have him stay on for purposes of continuity and stability when I would contend that he's been very unstable, his presence, um, in terms of all the layoffs and all the cuts in classes and the way that the union was being treated in negotiations. It was horrifying. I mean, they had unfair labor practice complaints that they won on. And what did we find in one of the unfair labor practices complaint that was that Martin went ahead with? We found that his vice chancellor for okay. for the budget what was was um, not even providing the former interim chancellor with informa budget information she needed to negotiate with the union. So he, he, here it's not even a conflict between the union and the administration. It was a conflict within the administration itself. And this guy continued to keep his job. And he's OK, so he's leaving in July. But Jesus, how could he have been there as long as he's been? The other thing that I want to point out, and this is just very anecdotal. But before the Board of Trustees at City College was restored to their position, they had to go through about a year of training, which was ridiculous. Can you imagine any elected official before they can hold their position having to get trained before they can hold it? I mean, that might be useful for someone like Trump. It'd be good to have him if he's elected. It, if he becomes president again, to be trained for about the next 20 years before he can hold office. But John Rizzo, who was on the board at the time, told me one day, our training was essentially that we're support we're to support the administration. So when the administration puts forward something, our job is to support it. So that tells me what's going on here because now we've got a board that will stand up to the chancellor. And that is the source of the conflict. You read through the ACCJC's report, it could have been written by supporters of the chancellor, by board, you know, with the help of board members who support the chancellor and other administrators. It's, it's really clearly they've taken a clear side in favor of the chancellor against the board of trustees, against the board of trustee members, especially supported by the union who are seeking to expand educational opportunities at the college. That, that's the way I read it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, Mary Lee, and then George. Yeah, uh, my question is for Kathleen. And not being familiar with this case in Florida, but you are, Kathleen. Is there any way that we could file an amicus brief that we could join in with their complaints? Okay. First, the complaint, if you scroll up in the chat, the first link is to the actual complaint that was filed last year by the state of Florida against various individuals in the Department of Education. And uh, yes, I mean, anyone, I, I, it's a federal case. So you could, there could be another state that adds on, which is not likely in our state because it appears the heads of the state appear to be pro-privatization. It's not to say that that's what the case is about. It's it's about challenging the constitutionality of the whole federal scheme of accreditation. And I hear a lot of people saying agency. They're not agencies, but they are officers of the United States. The, the definition of an officer is someone who wields significant power pursuant to the laws of the United States on a continuing basis. And since they have no supervisory role, the U.S. Department of Ed over their standards or anything they decide, they're also considered principal officers. So yes, I mean, it has to be someone with standing. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but standing means you have an actual harm. Uh, Mika's brief, you know, you can certainly, a group of people who have been um, effectively harmed by the actions of ACCJC or any accrediting uh, officer um, can certainly file an amicus brief. Um, you want to get an attorney kind of familiar um, to get on board with doing something like that. It's a lot of work. I mean, there's obviously this conversation encapsulates a lot of information 
but in reality, it's the kind of research that everyone on this panel has done just to kind of speak a little bit on the topic at issue. So you can imagine an attorney's job to get on board with this um, is going to require some work, but um, you certainly can do it. Yeah, uh, uh, two questions to the panel. Um, one, John Holmes mentioned this and the subtext of everybody else's comments, but I, I'd like to have some kind of definitive statement as to why City College has been targeted, recognizing that what there are some 112 other community colleges in California. Is there something symbolic in this oh. attack about City College? And I think the second question has to go to Kathleen, and this is related to the politics of this case. I, I, I hope I got it right. Is this a case that is being promoted by DeSantis and the right? And and the Florida, it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. How does this fit into a, a political analysis? I, I, I mean, for example, they're attacking books and and sociology, et cetera. Is this about states' rights, or is this part of a Trumpian strategy it's to certain, attack Democrats? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because the case doesn't outright but alludes to states' rights in discussing that the states have the sovereign right to govern their own institutions, which the states own. Mm -hmm. You know, it, state taxes go to these uh, state schools, whether it be a community college or a state college or UC, you know, it, it's the same thing in Florida. So I want you to all feel that, you know, you're not in a silo. This is happening throughout the country these abuses, these willy-nilly sanctions, these threats of accreditation status just based on considering a person for president or considering about asking someone to resign. This is happening elsewhere. So, you know, it's, it's not just City College of San Francisco, though within the state, certainly something's going on because it is the largest campus, or you could speculate they they want the real estate, but it's really publicly owned. I mean, it, it, City College is funded by public taxes. So um, there certainly would be a fight throughout the state uh, if that ever came to being. I think everyone with City College of San Francisco, I have to say, has done an excellent job keeping things afloat this long. <laughs> when Steve <laughs> asked me to talk, I said, is that still going on? <laughs> and to my shock, it is. <laughs> anyway. So, um, could, well, could I, I, could I mention about... So in supporting this case, are we therefore aligned with DeSantis? Well, I how mean, do we look, how, does, how does this? Obviously, DeSantis is not politically aligned with everyone on the panel. I can't speak to the other people in the audience, but, um, you know, banning books, don't say gay, um, you know, banning critical race theory. I mean, yeah, he's done a number of things that are just kind of ludicrous to me. Um, but the fact that no one else is challenging this federal scheme of accreditation, which is unconstitutional. I said it years ago. I'm sure I'm not the only person that has actually taken a look at the law and said, this it doesn't make sense. Who's reviewing this? How do you seek redress if they abuse their power? There is no way. Really, practically, there's no way. So, yes, he may have his own reasons. Uh, you know, it could be anything from revenge to, you know, they were attacked for a long time. And there was arguments going back be between uh, DeSantis because they um, did a bill in Florida to basically require all the colleges and universities to switch accreditors. Be and that's in response to the Biden administration saying they were going to look in to the possibility of no longer having regional monopolies. They were trying to avoid that. And so before anything got, you know, really fleshed out, you know, DeSantis is in there. Now, governors never make the law. I mean, yes, they, uh, <laughs> you know, can sway people, 
but it's always the legislature. So just to kind of clarify that, I thought I heard some people say the governor's trying to do this with the law, but they need the you know assembly and the Senate to do anything. They can't do it on their own. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is this political animus towards public education, but if you look at the case and the text of it, there is legitimate arguments being made, certainly arguments I thought of, and I'm pretty left. So, um, you know, I, I think there initially the Democrats can say, oh, there's just a bunch of radical lefts, you know, fighting with DeSantis. But that shouldn't matter if it has uh, has some teeth to it, because we all benefit if it is constitute unconstitutional then we need to fix the system, whether there needs to be some checks and balances in the federal government, or, you know, I don't agree with um, their case where they wrote kind of a side piece saying we could decouple funding from accreditation. Well, that doesn't make sense because the very principle of accreditation is not to release the funds unless they're accredited, ensuring quality. Now they're getting into, you know, willy-nilly determining how a state governs, who's the president. They don't seem to like elect, you know, democratically elected boards. That's obvious. And not just from City College, but from all these other schools I mentioned, where there's concrete examples where they were threatened with accreditation, losing all federal funding. So there is a constitutional issue. It's not great, but the, the reality is, is a Democrat really going to challenge the constitutionality of the system while a Democratic president is off it, in office? Doubt. I doubt, seriously doubt that's going to happen. It hasn't happened. Okay. Uh, the, the obvious problem there, not problem, but situation is political alignment on specific issues. Yeah, well, this is just the constitutionality. He doesn't go into, you know, yeah, banning yeah. books or anything like that. Another, another I mean, it's not that. him that's drafted the complaint, I should say. I'm sure he had influence with the wording. Um, he's a Harvard Law graduate, by the way, even though, you know, uh, really seriously, you know, to me, destructive policies in Florida. But um this is strict. So Ashley Moody is also a Republican. She's the state's attorney general. So, you know, everyone who signed on to the complaint is people within the state attorney general's office. I think if I remember, it was why San Francisco. Now, when we went under attack, yes, they mentioned we're the largest. In 2007, we were voted among the 11 best community colleges in the nation by a very good panel. Um, part of it was our size, and, and we were never in fiscal issues. We, we funded a hundred, over 100,000 students, and we're all, we never had audit problems. I mean, that's all been fake news lately, but it's, I've been there, and I've done the figures, and we've been very, very fiscally um, solvent all those years. However, as a blogger said when we were under attack in our takeover years, they, they know from a smaller community colleges, they were all watching us. I was in contact. Um, they know if they bring down the best, they'll bring down the rest. They went after San Francisco because, of course, it's San Francisco, but also, as Art Agnos and I discussed, if they bring down City College, it ruins San Francisco, too, and that is Washington, D.C., wouldn't mind that. But the, and the real reason, I think, is I've been around a long time, and this push to go back to junior colleges <clears throat> that, and I know from another source, that it was discussed that no no community college should have more than ten thousand students, and we have over had a had over a hundred thousand. They've got to they've got to just whack us down so that something that's been brewing since the nineteen seventies, and I've been in Sacramento a lot and all over the years, is to make city to make the community colleges <clears throat> a system run from Sacramento. It's number seven of the Student Success Task Force uh, recommendation. It's the only one that hasn't been done yet that you have a system, one union, like we just saw with the CSU trying to get a good contract, a system run by the state chancellor's office as a system out of Sacramento. And for that, for quote, ease of management, that's a direct quote, quote we have to have schools be no more than 10,000 students each. And that's, give, pick, a, pick a target. I've just given you several, <laughs> okay? 
Can I add to what, just adding to what Madeline says, a lot of it dovetails with her. Here's a few reasons. We'll never know the definitive one. The ACCJC was in favor of the Student Success Task Force. There were people, top people at City College who fought against it. That was the latest corporate agenda back in around 2012. Secondly, as Madeline said, if you can defeat, destroy, you know, if you can go after San Francisco, everywhere else will be a cakewalk. So if you can transform this school, then what's to stop them from easily running over all the other schools? And unfortunately, during the accreditation crisis, City College was isolated. It should have been a statewide fight and said it was mainly a city college fight. This part of the problem rests with the unions for not uniting people across the state because the ACCJC has sanctioned about a third of the community colleges in the state. Another thing which is kind of along the lines of what Matt was saying is that city colleges, I've taught at a lot of other community colleges, it's like a mini university. I mean, the diversity of programs, languages that are taught is incredible. It's like a university, you don't have that elsewhere. and that's one more reason for, you know, reducing it. And one of the things about us being like a mini university is the first chancellor to come in during the accreditation crisis um, said her name was Pam Fisher. And I remember I just livid when I was hearing her during um, Flex Week talking in the fall. She's wanting to say she was hip. She'd gone to Janis Joplin concerts. And then she decided to change her ways when she saw all the marijuana, even though she had smoked herself. But some young woman was there with her baby. She said, I just decided I had to jump to the other side. One of the problems that she saw was that we had too much in the way of what she called San Francisco values. Yeah. And what San Francisco values, I think if I could define it for her, was that we had big hearts. And when people wanted a particular kind of class, like a gay liberate class on gay liberation, City College offered it. Where other schools, it might be a big struggle before you get something like that. And she says, we can no longer live with a San Francisco heart guiding us. We need to get rid of our San Francisco hearts. In addition, there's the land in San Francisco. Land, unlike many other parts of the state, is really valuable in San Francisco. And a lot of the closing down of campuses is eventually to give the land to developers. The primary example of that is not City College land, but land that City College had used for years and years, which is called the Balboa Reservoir property owned by the Public Utilities Commission that was turned over to a for-profit developer for $11 million. People said the land was worth over $100 million. That land should have been just turned over to the college so the college could expand. Other things is that, you know, there's money to be made from the land and, um, the other thing, the bigger thing for me, and people may disagree, but City College student population is predominantly working class people of color. We are a classist and racist society, and this is just reflective of the, the endemic racism in our society, where you know the last groups of people that that the those in power want to educate are working class people of color and giving them the opportunities. I mean, it's. You know, I don't have I don't have to tell you this, George. You know about it better than I. Yeah, you guys have confirmed. Well, you've confirmed all of my prejudices. <laughs> I don't think they're prejudices. I think they're the reality. Okay, uh, John. Okay, everything Madeline Rick said was absolutely right. In fact, Rick, you just saved me a lot of time uh, in saying some of the things that I wanted to say on this. Uh, and I'll just I just want to emphasize uh, on that that if you want to start cutting down the community colleges, where do you start? You start with the college, which which has two, three, four times high an enrollment of community colleges than any other college in California. And the fact that it's the best union contracts. And of course, the fact that uh, colleges like uh, CCSF and like Peralta, uh, which have a higher uh, higher than usual enrollment of, of, of black and minority students, they always get the, this in a capitalist society, they, uh, in America, they always get the, the shitty end of the stick. So I think that pretty much summarizes that. Now I wanna get back to George's other question because I do after all teach American history. Uh, and I want to just say a, a quick historical comment. First of all, we should be very careful when we talk about the Constitution, because the Constitution was written, uh, and the founding fathers were extremely explicit about this, every last one of them, that there was too much democracy going on, and the purpose of the Constitution was to hold back the waves of democracy coming off of the American Revolution. This is best put by John Jay, who is one of the main authors of the Federalist Bay, who was America's first well, Supreme Court good. Justice, who stated that the, per the Constitution was written in order that the people who own this country will be the people who run it. That's a quote from our first Supreme Court justice. Now, about states' rights, 
The thing that has to be understood about states' rights is that perennially in American history, when you have got a state government which is more right-wing than the federal government, uh, they call for state, uh, states' rights. And when you have a state government that is more liberal, more left-wing than the federal government, they also call for states' rights. States' rights is it's a football, okay? Uh, just as it was, but I don't want to go into all the historical examples of that. I don't want to bore you all. Uh, so the thing you have to be understood with DeSantis is that both DeSantis and the Democrats uh, who, who, are, who are mostly behind ACGC want to censor and hold down and, and drag down the community colleges. The difference is that DeSantis wants to do it in his way and not the, the federal way. And that is the difference between them. And that is why uh, he is calling for states' rights. And we might, in some circumstances in California, especially if Trump gets in, uh, uh, we'll be wanting to talk about states' rights ourselves, right? Because uh, that's the way these things work. But the basic thing is that both DeSantis and the federal de uh, and the federal government, Obama, Biden, Jerry Brown, uh, Newsom, the whole gang, they're all our enemies. They're all the enemies of the community colleges. They're all the enemies of education for the poor. That's the thing we have to remember. And oh, by the way, uh, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about HELU, so I put a whole bunch of stuff up in the chat, including registration links. I hope I'll have a, a moment or two at the very end to talk about why these events are worth registering for, but I don't know if we'll have time for that. So I put it all up in the chat, including including especially a link to what, what is the higher education labor use and what it's all about. So I urge people to look at that. And if we have time, I'll say more about it towards the end. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thanks. And, and people can copy the chat so they can right. get all the links. Okay, Fred? Fred? Hello? Did somebody call Fred? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it, the hour is getting late. Could people chime in on ways that we could be fighting the ACCJC and how we can address our legislators in those directions? Well, I, I think one of the, the things is to educate, first of, all, first of all, what it is. That's why we're having this forum. The other thing is there should be a statewide campaign by the CFT uh, to take this up statewide and to join with other chapters, other locals and uh, community groups, uh, L, uh, you know, seniors. I mean, all the people that have been affected organize statewide uh, to, to defend community colleges and public education. But the, the the lack one of the political problems is because the uh, the CFT and all our unions, not the CFT, are supporting the Democratic Party. They don't want to fight Gavin Newsom. They don't want to fight the legislature. They're not fighting them, and they're not educating the members about how they're damaging public education. In fact, in San Francisco, uh, you have Mandelman and others who are taking wax at at San Francisco City College. So that is one thing that we can do statewide. And we could have a statewide conference uh, this coming summer during uh, Labor Fest of uh, Compton College and other colleges and school districts that have been hit by uh, ACCJC and uh, FICMAT. That would be another way of organizing if we wanted to, and we have to organize statewide. It's not just, and nationally, it's not just a, a, st a city state issue, it's a national issue. I just want to say, you know, whether you like or dislike DeSantis, I'm sure it's on the seriously dislike uh, category. It, it's irrelevant. This is a constitutional challenge to a system you've been abused by. And are they abusing their power? Yes. Are they trying to make uh, you know new standards after you've just complied with other standards that they added on? Yes. They're doing it across the country. So this constitutional challenge, regardless of who's bringing it, is important. I really uh, urge you to read the complaint. You there is a lot of citations in it. There's a lot of citations to the actual law, and it's legitimate. It's their legitimate arguments, and I and others have said it. it it's not constitutional, and so it, the system needs to be fixed. You talk about fighting ACCJC. Well, this is a national system. And it can only be fought be at the very root with the issues. We have a constitution, regardless of how we got there, this is what we have. 
a way of challenging the constitutionality of any law is to actually file a complaint and to look at these abuses of power, regardless if they're happening in Alabama, San Francisco, <laughs> Riverside, Riverside and you know San Francisco are within the state of California. They have very different politics. And yet I can guarantee you they've both been abused by the accrediting system. They're officers of the state and this needs to be taken more seriously. I mean, uh, someone in the audience, I don't remember who, suggested filing an amicus brief. And I think it's a good idea because the more and more that's exposed across the country, because this case may actually make it to the Supreme Court. And so it's going to have national impact. How it's fixed, whether it needs to be started over, certainly the federal government will always want a way to ensure the federal funds are not going to Corinthian colleges. But that did happen. They were receiving uh, accreditation and continually until the whole thing was exposed. And so it's the same thing with CCSF or any college. This thing has to be exposed at a national level. It can't be just a silo. If you act in silos, it's just gonna be groups of 20 or less, nothing's gonna happen. We're gonna have good discussions but we're not going to get any action, as it were. So I, I you know, I, I hope you look at the complaint. I hope you see Ron DeSantis, you know, evil character on many fronts, but it's irrelevant to whether or not the system is constitutional. And I have looked at it many times, although it's been years apart. And I remember saying over a decade ago, this doesn't even seem constitutional. They have all this power to do what they want and there's no review by the Department of Education, none. And in fact, the whole law says they're specifically prohibited of reviewing it. So to seek redress for abuse of power, there practically is none. I wanna thank you all for joining us. And I think we've had a valuable discussion tonight on topics and issues that really haven't been addressed uh, for some time. So we have to build solidarity. We have to build a education campaign and we have to fight to protect public education.